I'm retired Battalion Chief Larry Cockman, Chairman of the Greensboro Fire Department History Committee. The American Fire Service is rich in tradition and culture. A firefighter's life is filled with many emotional highs and lows. Stories of major fires, national disasters, medical calls, firehouse living, and family life are often verbally shared from one generation to another. Many times these stories are lost forever when a firefighter passes away. In an effort to preserve these stories, in 2019, the Greensboro Fire Department History Book Committee launched a new program of recording audio video of our retirees' lives. These stories will be shared on our website, gfhbc.org. In 2020, we did not record because of the COVID-19 pandemic. Please listen as these firefighters share their life experiences with all of us. My name is David Spears. Uh, I was hired on October the 1st, 1980, and I retired on February the 1st, 2011. I was here 30 years and four months. I retired at the position of deputy chief. I'm not from Greensboro. Say, uh, um, uh, I am from Augusta, Georgia. My father was in the military. He was in the Marine Corps for 24 years and uh, lived a military life as a kid. Um, lived all over the East Coast. Uh, we moved here in 1972 when he retired. Um, and I've been here ever since. Well, I was born in Fort Gordon uh, in Augusta, Georgia. I lived uh, for a number of years uh, in um, just outside of Quantico in a place called uh, Woodbridge. My dad uh, went to OCS at Quantico and then he worked at Marine Corps headquarters in DC for five years. Uh, so we lived there in that area for about five years. Uh, I lived in Moorhead, not Moorhead City, but I lived in Havelock down at Cherry Point on the, um, on the base down there two different times as a kid. That was the last place I lived before I moved here. And then I lived in uh, at the Naval Station in Philadelphia for a couple of years and I was real small. So we traveled around a little bit. I think I went to, uh, I figured it up once, I went to 12 schools before I graduated from high school. So a lot of moving around as a kid. Do I have any relatives on the fire department? Well, I have a brother-in-law or had a brother-in-law that was here, Chuck Martis. Uh, Chuck retired just in front of me. Um, my father-in-law also was uh, a firefighter here back in the 50s. We think somewhere 53 to 56, somewhere in that uh, time frame. And I'm actually looking into that now, trying to find some more information about it. Al Vaughn. When I came on the fire department, it was a complete accident. I had no interest in the fire department whatsoever. I had been living on military bases and around people in uniforms my whole life. I wanted to do something different. Uh, I wanted to be an accountant. When I got out of high school, I went to Elon. Um, I only went for a year. Uh, I didn't go back. Grades were fine, no problems, but I just decided it wasn't what I wanted to do. Um, and one Sunday, um, my girlfriend then, wife now, uh, Terry, uh, I was at her house uh, with her sister and her sister Cindy was taking food to her then husband Chuck Martis over at Station 8. Well, the truth of the matter is I didn't even know there was a fire station in the city of Greensboro. I'd never been in one. I had no interest in it. And I went over to Station 8 and uh, Chuck was on the back of the truck. He was new. Harold Robbins was the captain. No, Harold Robbins was a driver. A.B. Kimmel was the captain. And Frank Jones was the battalion chief over there. Uh, Deanne Staley was the other person on the back of the truck with him. And I thought, this is pretty interesting. And I just applied. Out of the blue, I applied. And I ran into the likes of you, and I got hired. Um, but... Um, you, you know, mean, was, who, who is you? Uh, Larry Cockman. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I, 
that seriously that the uh, I didn't know anything about the fire service. I didn't grow up as a kid wanting to be a fireman, um, but there was something that interested me there that day, and I just thought, well, I'm gonna put an application in and see what happens. When I applied for the fire department, uh, there were, seemed like there were about three parts to the process. Uh, part of it was a civil service test. Uh, we had to go down to the, I think, to the Social Security Commission and go through the testing down there. I met Hal Ritter there. Hal wound up being in my class when I got hired. That was the, he was the first person in the fire department that I knew besides my brother-in-law. Um, we came out here for a physical agility test. Uh, they made us run around with a Scott case, hang on a rope. Um, and then we had to do calisthenics. I can remember doing calisthenics in the auditorium. I was doing setups. Uh, I locked up, I couldn't go it up, I couldn't get down, and Larry Cockman, who was supervising me at the time, put his foot in the middle of my chest and pushed me back down to the floor so I could finish. So, And then somewhere along the way there was an interview. I had an interview there too, so, you know, it was, it's been 42 years ago now, so that's about what I remember of it. Um, my training officers, Larry Cockman and Randy Parrish. Uh, and uh, Frank Jones, uh, we were his, his uh, first uh, training class. I believe we were his first and his last because uh, he got promoted and, uh, and he moved on. When I came to work, I think my starting salary was one of two things. It was either $868 a month or $686 a month. It was one, it was one of the two. Um, I was working for a cable company when I, when I came to work here. Uh, worked there briefly after leaving school for about a year. Um, took about a $15,000 a year pay cut to come to work here at that point in time, which at that time was a lot of money. But this was a job that had benefits I could retire from. And it was something that my dad always told me, being in the military, is find something that's got benefits, something that you can retire from, and you know, make that your home. How many were in my training class? There were 18. Um, we were, we were uh, a pretty close-knit uh, group of individuals. There were uh, three uh, females in my class, uh, Edie Bailey, Lynn Snow, Deborah Butler, all great people, all did careers with the city. I think Deborah wound up retiring from the uh, police department, but she worked with the city for, with the fire department for a number of years. Um, you know, the um, so training. Who are some of the guys? Um, in my class, uh, Guy Patterson. Uh, Guy and I were as thick as two thieves. We were like brothers as kids he, from the time I was about 12 years old. Uh, it was interesting because neither one of us knew the other one applied. And in the first day, of, I walked in the class in the first day of training, and he's sitting there, and it's like, what are you doing here? Well, what are you doing here? So, but Guy, Steve Stone, Garen Foy, who left earlier, Ricky Lambert uh, was a very close friend who was killed uh, right after we got out of training. Uh, Steve Stone, Alan Archer, David Hood, uh, Willie Jones, Wow, I know I can recall That's Skip okay. Nix and, yeah. and, and Skip. I mean, I, I'm sitting there looking at that photo of us standing in front of that truck. I can kind of run down the list. But yeah. It was a good class. We were a close group of people. Yeah, you were. Training. I enjoyed training to the extent I was apprehensive about leaving and going out on the line. I loved training. I loved what we did. Uh, the, uh, the training officers were good to us. I mean, everybody worked hard. The class was close-knit. You know, we spent 16, I think we were in training for 16 weeks. We were all close, and it just got to be, it wasn't looking forward for training to be over. It was kind of, uh-oh, it's going to be over here soon, and you got to go start over again somewhere else. So training was, my training period set the stage for my whole career here because it's what I eventually came back to do is the job that I loved the most while I was here. Things that I was involved in while I was in training, um, I spent 10 years in training. 
Um, I was promoted to captain in 1986. I'd only, I was just eligible to be promoted. Uh, I went to Station 9 when I got promoted, and I was only there about 60 days. And Paul Brooks and Brad Cox talked me into coming into training. It was the best decision I ever made in my life. Uh, I spent 10 years here uh, at that point in training. I ended up making battalion chief while I was here in training. Um, and training at that point in time was kind of the nucleus of things that were going on in the fire department. Uh, part of the reason for that was we controlled a lot of the funding. The training had a large budget, so we were in, we were able to put programs in and do the training on them. While I was out here, uh, just things that I was a part of. I uh, didn't necessarily head them all up, but I was part of it. Um, we, uh, we, we moved uh, into large diameter hose while I was here. Uh, the four inch hose, they had tried with five inch earlier on, it didn't really work. We went to four inch. Uh, we changed out uh, air packs while I was here. We uh, went from um, uh, Scotts to Interspero at the time. We were using them extensively in uh, hazardous materials operations. They were working well, so we decided to try them everywhere else. And for a number of years, they were very well received. I uh, helped write and put in the accountability system while I was in training. Uh, we did the first high-rise training program while I was in training. We developed the first physical agility testing while I was in training. Um, you know, the, uh, the, uh, the FEO process came to fruition while I was in training. Um, it, was, uh, it was 10 years full of really kind of, kind of one thing after another, and I was working with people that were, when I started there, I was working with uh, Paul Brooks and with Brad Cox, and these guys are, you know, they're innovative, they're looking to make changes, and uh, it was good people for me to be around, and, and working with them, it was, uh, it was, uh, it's where I was best in my whole career, was the 10 years that I spent over here. I got to do a lot of things. Uh, one of the things probably uh, more proud of than, than a lot of it is, uh, um, Ray Cook and I actually did a presentation for staff about the need for a high-level rescue team and they agreed. Staff agreed. Uh, they sent Ray and I to Houston. We went to Houston and trained with a, a high-level rescue company uh, for a week or two weeks. And then we came back here. Uh, we were able to put a budget together. Uh, we were able to bring in those same trainers in here. Uh, and we started the Hilo Rescue Team out of Station 5 and, you know, that was kind of the uh, part of the nucleus for all the technical rescue teams that have really come about. Most of them started, with the exception of the Hazmat, started over and grew out of what we started over there at Station 5. So that was a, I was always, always very proud of that. Uh, the role that I got to have in it, the interaction, because it was a lot of hands-on stuff. We trained with those people all the time. It wasn't just handing off stuff to people. We were actually training them and going out and repelling off stuff together and running through scenarios. It was a, it was a good time. Um, while I was in training, um, we worked on this facility, the new training facility. Uh, I don't know, it's a project that probably went on for 10 years. Uh, wasn't uh, was not my brainchild. Uh, it grew out of a need uh, between the uh, police department and the fire department. Uh, just had the opportunity to work on it, uh, and uh, I guess in some ways, kind of help it come to fruition. Uh, I know a lot of the talk about the the number of rooms that we needed and how things were going to be laid out. We got to have input into some of that, so it, it was it was a good time. I yeah. like teaching. I like teaching. And I, I, I love that part of what I did. For, that's what I was the best at. When I was here, I was the best as a training officer. I, I knew it when I left. When I left you and Randy, I knew I wanted to come back. But I didn't know, I didn't know how I was going to come back. And I didn't, I wouldn't have, I probably wouldn't have come back if Paul and Brad hadn't talked me into coming back. You know, sometimes you just got to have a push, but it was the best decision I ever made. And I, I loved it. I loved training new people. I loved teaching new people. I, you know, you love, I love seeing people succeed. You know, while I was in training, 
we were like, we, we let 26% of the people we train go in, in the new classes. I mean, and that's always hard because you see people putting their heart and soul into trying to get a job and you got to tell them that this is not working. And that was, that was probably the most difficult part of the job that, that there was for me. I hated that. I hated it. And at the time, you know, we would carry people to the last day. Training to be 16 weeks long, and as long as we could take your academics and figure in 100, and if you would make 100 on the next test, if that would keep you above a 70 average, we would keep you in there as long as we could. Well, what would happen would be you'd get all the way to the last test, and there was, if he made 100, he could stay, but there's no way he would, so the last day you'd fire people. It was horrible. And we changed the protocol then to say that if you failed a test, any test, you got to retake. If you fail the retake, you're, it's gone. You're, you're, you're out. And it was just a way of to stop from dragging this inevitability on to the very end, which was cruel for people. My first station assignment, when I got out of training, I walked across the driveway and went to station one. Uh, and I was assigned to engine one. My first captain was Captain Johnny Teeters. Danny Nelson, was the driver on the truck. Uh, Bill Williams was on the back of the truck. Ty Miner was on the back of the truck. I was the fifth man. I was the recruit over there. Um, I loved it. You know, it didn't take long. Fit in over there. Um, I got transferred after my first year there. It was very much a surprise. I didn't know I was being transferred. According to my captain, he didn't know I was being transferred, but I got transferred. I got I only got sent to 12. Do you have any nicknames? Over there? Eh, probably not. I developed some when I was at Station 5. He used to call me IBM because I could memorize streets. It was IBM. just IBM. <laughs> um, and then later on, uh, Joe Wood started calling me Mufasa, so that stuck around for a while, so I still get that every now and then. So, Well, at Station 1, pranks. Uh, at Station 1, they had fold-up beds over there. I can remember waking up a number of mornings folded up in my bed where they would stand you up uh, or being trapped on top of a water tower over there with somebody at the bottom with an inch and three-quarter hose. Uh, but pranks didn't really come into their own until I got to Station 5. Uh, working with Randy Gordon and Paul Brooks and some of those guys over there and there's a lot of stuff that went on there that was uh, it was a lot of fun and there was a lot of payback along the way but it was all it was all good stuff yeah when I while I was uh, in the stations uh, and I only I was only assigned in on four stations I worked at station one I got transferred to station 12 I got transferred to five I got promoted and I went out to uh, nine which is now 49 but in every case, it was a close-knit group of people. We all cooked, you know. You know, you cook two meals a day. The guy, the whole idea of going out and eating and all that stuff had not really, you know, hadn't, unless you had come to the training center and you were out here for something for the day and you go out and get something to eat and come back. No, we all, we all cooked. We all had a rotation and. Did you cook? Good cook? Yeah, I, I could cook. Everybody you, learns to cook something. What was your specialty? I, I, I particularly like to grill. I used to cook a lot of pork chops. Um, what else? Uh, the old, everybody learns to cook the standby meal. Pinto beans, macaroni and cheese, uh, then tuna fish, egg salad. I mean, all that stuff just kind of rolls around. Well, what's the value in cooking together? Um, I, I think it's just the camaraderie that develops from all of it. I mean, you, you're, you're in the kitchen with, with each other. You're, you're, you know, you, you're, it's a weakness for some people, a strength for others. It's an opportunity to come together and make something turn out worthwhile. You know, it's kind of like uh, living in the dormitories. You know, when I was uh, when I was uh, in the living in the stations, there were no such thing as cubicles. I never lived in a cu cubicle. It was an open dormitory. And a funny story: uh, Paul Brooks and I uh, slept beside each other, and we were both assigned to the squad over at five. And we put our pants. We would hang our pants on the same uh, chair. Um, beside each other at night and uh, we got a call one night went out road to call 
come back, looked at each other. I got on pants that come down to about my knees, and he's walking on his. So I had put his pants on. He had put my pants on. But, you know, it's just the, it's just, it's everything that goes on. It's all the jokes. It's all the kidding. It's all the sharing. It's, uh, you know, it's, um, you know, we talk about, we call each other brothers and sisters and, if you if you really take to heart what that what that means i mean you become brothers and sisters and you you know you you you're in situations that are you know that are challenging that are dangerous and you learn to you know you learn to look after each other and take care of each other i mean i don't have any brothers i have a sister but you know there's a lot of guys here on this fire department that i feel like i'm as close to as if i if i would have had a brother and it all came out of riding that truck together or, you know, or sharing that bedroom together or sharing countless times in offices. And, you know, one thing about my career, I didn't spend a lot of it on a fire truck. At six years, I was gone. I never rode a fire truck again after I was, after I made captain and came to the, the training center. So. Some of that side of it, I, I, I missed out on. You know, I didn't get to be a part of all that. But I got to be a part of so many other things that would shape where the fire department was going to go and how it was going to get there. And, you know, that to me was that just, you know, while I was here for the 30 years I was here, I lived it, I ate it, I slept it. It was my life. I mean, it's, it was important. Cubicles versus the dorms, I think it's just changes like society changes, you know. People, you know, people are interested in their privacy. I understand that. I don't begrudge that of anyone. I just, uh, I preferred the other. I like the, you know, I like the throwing the pillows across the room with the guy snoring down on the end. I like all of us laying there in the bed watching television. I like I, just the communal living. I mean, I think it's that simple. You know, when a retired firefighter visits a station, why is it important to spend time with that person? I've learned a lesson about all that in the last 12 years. There were people that I worked with uh, I, that I had just tremendous amounts of respect for. Uh, uh, Frank Jones being one of them. I, I, would have, I probably would have never got a job with the fire department if it wasn't for Frank Jones. My driving record looked like a rap sheet. When I was 16 years old, 17 years old, 18 years old, everywhere I went, I went in a hurry. And I had the tickets to prove it. And if it hadn't been for Frank and probably his relationship with my father-in-law, I would have never, never gotten a job in the fire department. I would have never, when I looked at my driving record, had I been on the hiring end, I would have never hired me if I'd have saw all that. But to make that point, I loved Frank. and. When he left, he disappeared, and he never came back. I never saw him. I, ne I never, other than a few times I talked to him on the telephone or ran into him somewhere else, I, he never came back to the fire station. And after, you know, you, you, I, I've thought about that a lot over the years, and now I understand it. I see it. Because when I go into fire stations now, there's nobody there I know. There's, you know, I, I don't live too far from 59. I stop in there. I've stopped in there a couple of times over the years, uh, not very often. But, you know, I walked in, uh, I walked in Station 5 about six weeks ago uh, to check on the, uh, one of the uh, captains that had gotten injured. I was curious about how he was doing. And um, there was one guy sitting in there. I knew who it was. One. And it's awkward. And that's, and that's part of the reason why you just don't, it's not the same place it was. My memories and, you know, it might be the same station, but these guys, they're taking things in a whole different direction. It's going to a whole different level. You know, I can understand why the interest with them is not with me when I walk in a building, okay? I, I get that completely. But for me, it's just as awkward. You go in and you don't really know who anybody is there. You know, if I want to see somebody I know in the fire department, I pretty much have to go over to the administrative building anymore because most of those guys, well, actually, of uh, the leadership in the fire department right now, I train Jim Robinson, I train Dwayne Church, 
and I trained Alex Goss. So those guys I knew, and I knew from the beginning, and I'm comfortable going over there and seeing them, but just to walk in a fire station for a group of guys, and I don't know anybody there, it's just it's a little unnerving. Well, the whole, the whole thing with the Firemen's Club now, I mean, I've been out there, uh, I joined three months ago. Um, I joined the first time that I went, because when I went, there were nearly 100 people out there that most of them were... And uh, I work with almost all of them. I walk in there and it's a whole room full of people that I know. So it's a very comfortable place to go, you know, and it's a lot of people to rehash things that have happened in the past or whatever. But, you know, I, that, that's just the difference. The difference is just familiarity. That's all, that's all we're talking about. In 12 years' time, this place is growing by leaps and bounds, and they're hiring two or three classes a year now. It's it's uh, there's so many new faces here. It's just it's it's just it's the evolution of the fire department. Fire. I remember my first. Do I remember my first call? I certainly do. I was on engine one. It was up here on um, uh, let's see, on Church Street. It's the big white house just before you get to the bridge. And the guy on the second floor was smoking pot and set the alarm system off. That was the first fire call I rode, or the first time I rode the truck. The first working fire that I rode of any significance was the Carolina Theater. Um, that was uh, while I was still over here at, at Engine One, and that was that was quite an experience. That was a big fire for the time. One of the, actually one of the bigger fires I probably saw. Well, I, I, as a as a district commander, I got involved in in quite a few things. You know, along the way, we had a couple of second alarm fires downtown. I was involved in one on Elm Street. I was involved in the uh, windshield uh, uh, washer fluid plant over there off Holden Road uh, when that burned. Uh, as a captain uh, at Station uh, Nine, I had one call, uh, at one fire call or working fire call. It was when the train hit the tanker at Market Street out there. That was my first working fire is on an engine company. Um, How was that? Uh, we were a second alarm company. Uh, you know, when you pulled out the door, there was no doubt that there was a problem not too far from where we were because there was a column of black smoke in the sky. It looked like two miles high. but. You know, it. Um, I was at Worth Chemical on uh, that incident out there. I think I was a safety officer on that. I got tied to a lot of incidents because I spent a number of years as a safety officer. I spent a number of years as a district commander. Um, I wasn't out there in the car as a battalion chief. I never, that was never my role. What's the value of a firefighter's responding to medical calls? Well, I spent... Uh, about three years on squad five running out of station five. I rode my share of medical calls in the three, three or so years I was out there on that. And uh, at the time, when I first started, they weren't, uh, they weren't sending the engines out, ladder trucks out on anything. The squads were catching all of it. And we might drive by, I mean, our territory was a full third of the city, and I might drive by two or three fire stations to go to a medical call that was just the other side of a fire station. So my eight or nine minute ride, 10 minute ride to get there is critical when somebody's in arrest or depending on what's going on. I think the idea of the fire department doing first responder uh, medical calls, I, I think it's probably the smartest thing that we ever did. I mean, because it's a value to the people. I mean, we provide a service. We're an expensive service uh, and we are, you know, we're more strategically located than EMS or, or any, any response agency. Nobody's closer than we are, so why wouldn't we? And I think it's more about the question that was a huge, it's been a huge issue in the fire department in my days because if, if a lot of the engine guys would tell you I didn't sign up for that. But, you know, when I was on the squad, so I guess I was on the flip side of that, uh, I can remember being scared to death on on the first calls. I mean, we'd all been through EMT training, and uh, I couldn't wait to get my first CPR out of the way. If I could just get that over with, I'd be okay. And I was riding with Ricky Willits, and we got a call over off of Isaac Street, and uh, that was my first CPR. And after I got past that, you know, you kind of 
you good to go, you're good to go with it at that point, I guess you, you would say. But you know, I do think it's a valuable service, and I think the entire fire service looks at that differently now. I think everybody knows it's a place they need to be, it's something they need to be doing. Well, I, I think the, the ICS system grew out of a, of, of a more of a nation, national movement, not just what we were doing here, but, um, you know, the whole high-rise program and stuff that we implemented here was a result of seeing what was going on, not necessarily in Greensboro, because we had never really had a big high-rise fire, but we were seeing big high-rise fires in other cities. And when you go back and started evaluating what our resources were and what our capabilities and really what we knew about those big buildings, I mean, we, we were lacking. There were some things that we needed to address. And we did. And we came up with a whole high-rise standard operating procedure. And we trained on elevators. We trained on building-type construction. We trained on tactics. And then we would go downtown on Saturday mornings and they would allow us to use these buildings and we would run drills in those buildings in order to refine it all. I mean, it's uh, it's an area that we were weak in in the beginning, but I think it's an area that we we develop quite well in over time. Do I think 9/11 changed the way we look at firefighters? The way the public yeah. looked at us. Yeah, I, I think 9/11 changed everything. Not just the way the people look at firefighters, but I think you know for a long time uh, it uh, mm, the influence on the nation. You know, it's just it was. Incredible! I remember standing in my house, in my office on that on the morning. Uh, I was at district commander in station uh, at station eight, uh, district commander for battalions three and four, and Danny Underwood uh, was in there with me, and he and Terry Hahn were switching shifts, and we stood there and watched this thing, you know, unfold, and uh, you just and, and I, I can't. I don't know if I'm going to say this, I can't remember if, if this is the right number or not, and there, somebody may be watching that would know, but to my knowledge, on that, during that time, the 343 firefighters that they lost was the same number of people that was assigned to the Emergency Services Division and Fire Department here. So it would have been like wiping out the entire fire department one morning. Now, that number has been in my head since then. Uh, I believe it to be the truth. I, I could be wrong. People that I looked up to in the fire department. Well, when I started uh, the fire department, I went to station one. I had Captain Teeters was my uh, captain at that point. And, he was aggressive at training and, and education and pushing and he was good for me. I mean, it was, a, it was just a continuation of my training. So he was a good place for me to be assigned. I think he was in the process of about to make battalion chief then too. So he was, he was very engaged. Um, and then I, I went to, uh, when I went to five, it's probably the probably the more people made an impact on me than anywhere else over there. I, uh, I had, uh, you know, we always talk about leadership and uh, who were your, who were, who were your, um, who were the people that you would follow, you know, and A.C. Farmer was at the top of my list. Uh, I loved the guy, you know, he was, uh, I looked the other day and uh, I saw he made captain Two months after I was born, I was born in August of 1960. He made captain in October of 1960, and he was my first captain. Well, he was my captain when I went to Station Five. So he had been a captain for 23 years when I when I got there. But he was a uh, he, uh, he was an older guy, uh, but he was good in in so many ways, training and education and making sure you knew your job. Gary Church was another one that was over there at, uh, at Station 5 that was just, uh, he was uh, 
phenomenal uh, people to work with you know for for somebody that was motivated and wanted to be doing things these are guys that wanted to be engaged all the time and it was just it was right up my alley ab kimmel ab took me under his wing over there he got me out of 12 he brought me over to five um i had you know i had people that i felt like that believed in me they encouraged me uh, they said they said they were good they were good role models uh, I, I just, uh, you know, and, and I would have always said during during my career, you know, and I've, I've named them outside of my father, uh, uh, AC and Gary and probably Johnny Teeters. I mean, the three of them were probably the greatest three role models that I that I had here. I mean, I just um, they were very different, very different from each other, but there was something I got something. From, from all three of them that helped me to, to, I guess, to grow to be the person that I became in the fire service, that, that helped me to get from point A to point B. I mean, that was, uh, it was all good. Yeah. Would I do it all over again? I would absolutely do it all over again. Well, I think we would all do something different. I mean, I can't tell you right now that, that uh, Everything I did was was the right thing every single time, but I hmm. I'm proud of what I did while I was here. I got to do a lot. I got to do more than most. I, uh, I was given a lot of freedom. Uh, sorry. A lot of people trusted me. And uh, I would do just about anything not to lose that trust. You know, and I, I I felt like I built my I built my career around that. And every job that I had, I put everything that I had into it. I always, I always, I always put people first. It was never about me. It was never about a promotion. I never sought a promotion. That was that was never the end game for me. I, I felt like that. I. I did what I did, I did it well, and somebody wanted to give me something else to do, and that's the reason I kept moving. It had nothing to do with, I can't, I, I need to be this, or I need to accomplish that. I just wanted to do the things that I did well. And I, I believe that, you know, my stamp is that I left the fire department in a better shape than I found it in. And I, I can, I, I, I can go through every one of the jobs that I had, and I can list the, all the accomplishments and stuff that I had in those jobs, you know. And I and it's it's not a point to to brag about. It's just that that's what drove me. That's what that's what I wanted to do. I, I wanted to make the place the best the best that I could make it. And, uh, and so would I go back and change anything? No. I, I, I well probably. Uh, I don't know what that would be though. You know, uh, a lot of times I was harder on me than I should have been on me. I mean, uh, I, I tried to be fair with people. I treated people like people. Um, at least I think I did. Uh, I felt like I did. You know, if, if I if I didn't, I I, I wasn't I wasn't aware of it. The very first death, and then probably one of the hardest ones, was uh, when Ricky Lambert got killed. Ricky was in my, uh, he was in my recruit class, and he and I were very, we were very close. And uh, he was killed in a car accident out off of Alamance Church Road. We were both, uh, we were working at five on two different shifts over there, and um, that was really kind of my first, my first encounter with death of you know somebody that I was, I was close to. And then when I got promoted to captain and I came to training, 
in my first recruit class. We had a guy that was killed. One of my trainers, one of the recruits was killed in a motorcycle accident. Tim Parrish. Uh, and that class bonded around that incident in a way that I, I, you would have to talk to them about. But that was the, I believe it was the 37th or 38th. It's the class that Craig Smith was in. He just, had just retired. Um, and in my second class, we had a suicide. Aaron Fuller committed suicide in my second class. Um, and then along the way, you know, there's, I rode the squad and death was just a, it was a part of coming to work. I mean, you, it used to worry me because you got so immune to it. I mean, you saw, you saw so much death, you know, whether it was vehicle accidents or CPRs or whatever that you, I used to, used to concern me that if I wouldn't, it wouldn't bother me if something happened in my family, you know, because you're around it so much. But you find out after you get away from it, you get back to where you were. Reality kind of checks back in, but it's, uh, it's something that you have to, you have to compartmentalize over. You have to be able to separate yourself from it. You have to be able to do your job, but it's still a, a, a reality that's there that, that you get confronted with. So, uh, female firefighters that I worked with, while I was at Station 5, uh, Anita Strong was over there. She was on our shift um, for a while. Um, I spent years working with Deanne Staley. Deanne was uh, one of the deputy chiefs when I was a deputy chief, so she and I worked together every day for, you know, for a number of years. I made deputy in 2004. She made it a year or so before me, so from 2004 to 2010 or 11 when I left, I mean, we, we were working together. I, uh, how many female firefighters did I train? Well, I can remember some names. Elaine Crutchfield, Kathy Smith, um, Wow. Um, Swiderski. Yeah. Uh, yeah. All did a great job. All good. All good people. I used to tell everybody Elaine Crutchfield was the toughest recruit I ever I'd ever met. The woman had no quit in her. How long did I serve as interim chief? About 18 months, somewhere in the ballpark of that. I was uh, I served from the time Chief Teeters left until uh, they hired Greg Grayson, and uh, once they hired Grayson. I went back to administrative services and I stayed with him. I don't know, it must maybe six months. They were they were uh, the budget was getting ready to come up, okay, which is a which is what drives the fire department, the money and stuff that we could acquire. And I stayed to put the budget together for him. And after we submitted the budget or got it ready for submission, I left in February of 2011. How has is, how is the job changed since I came on? I think the, the probably the bigger thing is all the technical things these guys are doing now. You know, the you, you said the medical stuff, but the medical is far beyond even what we were doing then. What they're doing in EMT now is a lot more than we were doing 40 years ago. But, I mean, you're dealing with all the USAR programs now, the hazardous materials program now. You know, they're still involved in the regional, uh, the uh, regional response team. They're, uh, you've got the foam task force and all that set up out there. I mean, there's just so many, there's so many specialties that, that you know, that you can, uh, you can be involved in. And the nice thing about it is for a firefighter is that you can specialize in any of those things and you can move around anymore. So you got opportunities to do different things. Yeah. It's not just riding the truck. I think my dad being in the military, yeah, helped me or changed me. It molded me. You know, he was a he was a man's man. He was a major in the Marine Corps. He didn't take no crap. He didn't take no crap off David. Um, and I walked pretty. I walked a pretty straight line for a number of years. So. Okay, I would describe a successful fire. How would I describe a successful firefighter? Really, it's just about being content with what you're doing. You know, if everybody we hired had to be the chief of the fire department, 
there'd be a lot of miserable people here. You know, there's guys that their aspir uh, aspiration is to be a driver or to be a captain or maybe even to ride the back of the truck or to be a battalion chief, or to do the audio-visual training, or to be a training officer, or to work in planning and research. I mean, it's, it's, not, it's not somewhere that you're trying to get to. When you find your place, and you're happy in that place, you're successful. You know, and a lot, a lot of people leave here that don't go way through the ranks and stuff. That doesn't make them more or less successful than people who advance far. You know, you, you find a place where you're happy. And as long as you're happy, it's all good. Um, I mean, I, I, my father, you know, my father. I, I, you just, you can't get around, I can't get around that. I mean, my, my dad, my dad is, uh, he was uh, the greatest influence in my life. He uh, got me started off on the right foot, and but I but I met people here that shaped my life. You know, the the Gary Churches and Farmer, AC Farmer, and Brad Cox and and Paul Brooks. I mean, all of these guys are, are guys that I spent a ton of time with and around. Ricky Willits, you know, and I could go on. Joe Smith, Jerry Toombs, Jerry Schamberg. I mean, all of these people are people who played some role. And if I went back and told you about each one of them, what you'd find out is they all taught me something. And they all took the time to teach me something. They took an interest in me. They taught me to drive. They taught me to pump a truck. They taught me to teach. They encouraged me. You know, there's, they all had a role. What would I like the fire department to remember about me? Hmm. I, I did my part, you know? I, I did my part. I, 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 didn't, I didn't cut any corners. Um, I tried to do what I did well. I got to be involved in a lot of things, and uh, I tried to put my best foot forward. And, and, and I, most of all, I hope that I didn't offend anybody along the way. You know, that their memories. You know, if they look back at me and think about you know their interaction with me. That it would be something positive. You know, you you can't supervise people and not have issues. I mean, that that that's not possible. But you can have issues with people and be fair and you can treat them fair and they know like you know when you've done wrong they know when they've done wrong there's no no need in, in berating people or, or beating up on them beyond accomplishing what needed to be done and that's changed the behavior and I hope I never did anything beyond that what value is there in these interviews well, I guess it, it, it's it's about the past it's about you know documenting what's happened in the past and uh, I don't know what I, I have no idea what somebody that might sit down and watch this later on might think I, I don't know they may think that guy's out of his mind I mean it's hard it's hard to say I, I don't know um, I do you know the, the thing <laughs> the thing you hope the thing I think that, that, that would come out of all of them is that is the passion that we all, all had for the job you know and the different aspects of, of the job. I mean, I loved it here. I, I loved it here. But it was time for me to leave. You know, there was a new chief here. I didn't need to be in his way. I needed to go. And I knew it was time for me to leave. And that's what they always said, you'll know when it's time to go. And, uh, and I knew it. And I, and I left. And I don't regret it. Uh, I miss it. You know, I, I look back at um, watch Chief Nugent. You know, when, as he was here as the chief, and, and you think, you know, I could have stayed that long. I could have, I mean, I could literally, I'm 61 years old, I could have still been working, but I went on to do some other things that I loved almost as much as the fire department. And uh, it's, all, it's all been good. I have no regrets. In closing, the Greensboro Firefighters History Book Committee hopes you have gained a greater insight 
into the dangers, the challenges, and emotional events that have influenced and shaped the American power project.